Okay, let's, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day because this is a day that you have made. And we thank you that we have been delivered out of darkness into the light in the kingdom of your son, Jesus Christ. And we commit to live free from worry in the name of Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life of Jesus Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. And we humble ourselves right now under your mighty hand because we know that in the near future you will exalt us. We cast all our cares, all our worries, all our anxieties, and all our concerns upon you. And Father, we delight ourselves in you. And we let not our heart be troubled. We abide in your word and your word abides in us. We just thank you right now, Father. We are carefree and we walk in peace that passes all understanding. We just pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, you know, I always start out with a little funny here. This, this one is called a sure cure. There were three pastors in the south, and they were having lunch in a diner. And one said, you know, since summer started, I've been having trouble with bats in my loft at the attic in the, at the church. And he said, I've tried everything. I've tried noise, I've tried spray, I've tried cats, but nothing seemed to scare the bats away. And then and another one said, yeah, me too. I got hundreds living in my belfry and in a natric attic. And I've, been, I've even had the place fumigated and they won't go away. So the third pastor said, well, I baptized all mine and made them members of the church. Haven't seen a bat come back yet. <laughs> I thought that would get you going. Okay, tonight we're going to talk about uh, the cares and the violence in this world that we live in. And uh, you all know that uh, with this terrorist attack that happened uh, against the United States in 2001, the memory of that is just etched in all of our minds. But it has become a major concern of people of what could happen in the near future. And uh, it is so bad to our government and other governments all over the world have a major concern about terrorist attack. But a, a lot of people, like I said, are worried and fearful about what could happen in this threatened society that we live in. So I guess my question is, how are we as Christians supposed to respond to these evil days that we live in? Now, first of all, we have to understand that the Lord gave a warning as his second coming approach that we would see these things going on in the world. So why should we as Christian folks be worried about what's going on in the world? Because God is not a worrying God. Now, you, we should be concerned, sure, but we shouldn't be worried, not as Christian people. Because God didn't worry about Adam and Eve in the garden. He was concerned. Thank you, honey. He was concerned so much until he told them not to eat of that forbid fruit. That's how concerned he was, but he wasn't worried about them. Now, we should be concerned, but not worried as Christian folks. People are worried about the economy. People are worried about their stocks. Why are you worried about your, the economy and worried about the stock? Do poor people worry about the economy? Do poor people worry about stocks? No. So we as Christians, we should be worried about those things of the world because those things... Man is in, in charge of that. And just about anything that man is in charge of, it's going down the tubes. Now, what we need to do really is trust in God. I have a, a lot of family members that 
are not saved. They don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That saddens me. But I'm not worried about them. I'm concerned, but I'm not worried. I've done what I had to do, what God has told me to do. Let's try and lead them to the Lord. But they have a choice. So I'm not worried about that. Concern, yes, but worried, no. See, I put my hands in, in their hands in the Lord. And their situation, I give it to God. And that's where it stays. My kids got two boys. I don't worry about them. I give them to the Lord. I learned that from pastor. Give it to God. Leave it there. Don't worry about it. Be concerned, but don't worry. We all, I, including myself when I say this, we all need to stop worrying and humble ourselves. That's what we need to do. We need to humble ourselves. God says in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 14, that if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal, heal their land. Now, a lot of people don't want to hear that there is something wrong with them or a lot of people don't want to hear or uh, uh, own up to the fact or even realize that there is something wrong in the country that we live in. You know, right now, homosexuality, it's okay. Abortion, it's okay. Divorce, it's okay. Children being born out of uh, wedlock and premarital sex, it's okay. You know, you see, we think sometimes just because we sing God Bless America, God is going to bless us because we're such a good people. But that ain't the way it works. All those things that I just mentioned, God don't want that stuff going on. We as Christian folks, we shouldn't want that stuff going on either. But don't worry about it. Be concerned, but don't worry about it. God will take care of it. God will take care of it. But God is saying a lot of things to us. He's saying to us, if you want my blessing, you got to humble yourself. Now, in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 4 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. We see that every day. So there is no doubt in my mind of the time which we live in. We are living in a time and a season for the return of Jesus Christ. And now knowing this, I'm not worried about, you know, what's happening in the world. Concern, yes, but not worried. There are other scriptures in the Bible that gives me peace, and I'm sure it gives you all peace about what's going on in this world. Matthew 24, 33 says, So likewise ye... When ye see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of all that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not even the angels in heaven but my father only. But as of the days of Noah were, we shall also, shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in 
the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them away. So they shall also, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, that scripture that I just read, th that's what happened in Noah's day. But let's compare that with what's going on in our time, in our day. Genesis 6, 5, 13 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Continually. Not just sometimes, but all the time. Continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping things and the fowls of the air. For it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japhet. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way, his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, those scriptures, to me, clearly describe the very day that we are living in. The condition of violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition of the earth today. Ain't, ain't no different. It's a little bit more sophisticated, but it ain't no different. Now, and there's a lot of people, Christian folks, non-Christian folks alike, that are crying out that the violence be removed from our society. And people are demanding that the governments do something about all this wickedness on the earth, but they don't realize what really is causing all this stuff that's going on in the earth. They just don't know. They believe that if the government passed certain laws, that all this violent behavior that we see is going to be corrected. No, that ain't the case. Our government, as well as any other government in the, in the world that hates violence, have done a lot of things to try to curtail the violence on the face of the earth. But see, there's not enough laws for every offense and not enough police manpower to police the system or enough prisons to hold all these wicked folks. But we can thank God for the police that we have and the prisons that we do have to keep all these wicked people in check. Now, God, in his mercy and wisdom, He's used good governments to restrain lawlessness throughout history. Not just, he ain't just started this, all through history. You know, but however, corrupt governments can cause the suffering of mankind. Governments start off good. You know, God designed governments. He did. God designed the governments as an instrument so that man wouldn't hurt each other or they wouldn't destroy each other to keep them in check. God designed government. But when they get, you get governments and they become corrupt, everything changes. You see, our government or any other government, we don't want the government controlling everything. That's one thing that we don't want. Woodrow Wilson once said that the history of liberty is a history of limitations 
of governmental powers, not the increase of it. So we don't want the government controlling everything. We want God controlling everything. He is in control, but he allows things to happen. Now, but I know and you know that violence will never be totally removed until that root cause is corrected. Now, all this madness that we see going on today uh, can't be dealt with by hiring more police. It can't be dealt with by uh, more uh, arresting more offenders and building bigger prisons to hold them. The prisons are already overflowing. They are already filled up to capacity. All these things that's going on are going to happen. As Christian folk, don't worry about it. Be concerned, but don't worry about it. There was a tree in the garden the uh, of knowledge of good and evil. And right today, men and their programs are pruning the branches of that evil tree while that root still remains intact. So what is the root of all the violence that we're witnessing? It's simple. Pastor Bob say, it's simple, not complicated. It's rebellion against God and his laws. So as long as that root is untouched, that tree is only going to grow branches and bear rotten fruit. And the only remedy to the problem in the earth that we live in is that every human being on the face of this earth, we all have to repent, turn to God, keep his laws, keep his commandments, and allow Jesus Christ to change the evil nature of man into the nature of goodness. That's the only way. This is what I call a corporate turning to God. And a corporate turning to God can only take place when God brings judgment against the evil in the earth and removes it. And then he sets up his millennium kingdom in this earth. You see, what I just said can't be done by man alone. It can't happen by man alone. We have to let God step in, take over, before we destroy the earth and each other. And that's what's going to happen if God don't step in and take over. That's exactly what's going to happen. People, we need to repent now, not tomorrow, because tomorrow's not promised. We need to repent now so we can avoid all this violence that's going to take place and it's going to increase. So we need to repent now. And during the time of violence that we have on the earth right now, there are many innocent people destroyed, as well as wicked people too. But as Christians, we should pray for ourselves and the wicked to seek God with whole hearts so we all can be among those that are spared destruction. That's what we all have to do. Matthew 24, 12 through 14 says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then the end shall come. Now, through all that's going on in the world, God is always trying to get our attention. Always. He never lets up. When I was running around half crazy, 
God was always trying to get my attention. I didn't realize it until later on. But he was always trying to get my attention. He's always trying to get each of you. you. He's trying to get your attention. But a lot of times, just like I was, we get too busy with our own agendas. We don't hear his voice. All we hear is us. It's all me, 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 me. But God uses all types of things and methods to get our attention. God used creatures to get our attention. God used places to get our attention. He uses things to get our attention and bring us back to our senses. You know, God used a mule to talk to Balaam because God knew he was about to curse his people. He used the rooster to remind Peter that he lied and turned his back and denounced his own savior. God used an, an ant to teach lazy people how to be smart and prepare for the future. Now ain't God all right. <laughs> now the Bible prophesies about all the events that would take place in this world that we live in. And the explosion of violence worldwide is one of those events. And we begin to see this process takes, take place in part as we are in the shadow of the millennial kingdom right now. We see that. And the Bible also speaks of a time of judgment that occurs during a tribulation period before the Lord's second coming. Matthew 13, 38 through 43 says, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. Verse 40, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. 41, the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all the things that offend and them which do iniquity. Now, all of the things that offend unrighteousness or wickedness. He's going to gather all that out of the kingdom and everything that offends. There's a whole lot of things that offend God. But me, personally, I think that disobedience ranks right up there at the top. Who disobeyed God, disobeyed God first? Adam and Eve. Look at the shape of the world because of sin. When they disobeyed God, sin came into the world. To me, disobedience is right there at the top. 42. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. They shall be, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear what the Spirit is saying. He who has ears to hear. Now these terrorists, these wicked people in this parable are being bundled up for destruction because of their evil ways. 
while God at the same time is separating his people from the world system so that he might protect and reward them which is a form of judgment. Now, a lot of times when people hear that word judgment, they think of that word with evil connotations, like execution of the penalty of sin. But judgment also has a positive side. We've heard pastors say that often. There's two sides to it. You see, judgment has to do with sowing and reaping. And that process is defined in Galatians 6, 7 through 9. Be ye not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, it may take 20 days, 20 years, but you will reap what you have sown. He says it in this Bible. He will not be mocked. When God tells you something, it's going to happen. Oh, I got away with this. No, you didn't. You're going to reap that down the road. Sooner or later. Verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. Now, the Bible says that there is no good thing in the flesh. No good thing in the flesh. So, if we so to the flesh, we're going to reap corruption. Because God said he would not be mocked. Verse 9, And let us not be weary in doing well, for in due season we shall reap if we not faint. Now, from these scriptures, we can see that the negative side of judgment is evil. that is sown, which reaps destruction. While on the positive side, good that is sown through Jesus is rewarded. Now God's judgment on evil is seen by the curse that is on wicked men. While God's judgment for the righteous will manifest in his blessings and reward. So if you're doing good, you're going to get rewarded. If you're doing bad, you're still going to get rewarded, but it ain't going to be a good reward. You know, some innocent people are destroyed during the reaping and sowing process, but they will get their rewards in heaven. That's a promise. The Bible declares that the way into the kingdom is straight and narrow. And very few find it. Very few. Luke 13, 24 says, Strive to enter at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Strive to enter at the straight gate. Now that's telling me to put forth every effort, every effort. Don't be lackadaisical about entering in at that gate. Now remember, the Holy Spirit is there to help you with your striving. Like Pastor Bob always tells us, you got your part? And God got his part. So if you do your part and strive to enter in at that straight gate, guess what? The Holy Spirit is going to do his part to help you strive to enter into that straight gate. 
Matthew 7, 14 says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there will be that find it. You, you see, men don't like to be restricted. Men want to do things their way. This includes you too, ladies. And because men don't like a straight and restricted way, we are seeing destruction on the earth at a massive, massive level at this hour. And believe me, it's not God initiating all this destruction against mankind through the curse of the earth. But it's the result of the evil that's manifesting in destruction. God ain't doing it. It's the evil that's manifesting in destruction. Because, you see, God can't do any evil. I don't even think God knows how to do evil. And God knows everything. But he can't do no evil. Hey, God, all right. <laughs> See, God is righteous. God is pure. And all the negative judgments that are in this world, manifesting in violence, terrorist acts, wars, Earthquakes, floods, fires, hurricanes, tornadoes, and on and on and on are a direct result from broken spiritual laws. Broken spiritual laws. My dad used to say <laughs> that the law wasn't made for him. Wait, Dad, I, the law was made for everybody. He said, no, the law was made for lawbreakers. Your daddy ain't no lawbreaker. So therefore, the law ain't made for me. You know? And I said, well, hey, okay. <laughs> Ezekiel eleven twenty one says, but as for them whose heart walketh after the heart, of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their heads, said the Lord God. Now, really what we need to do, excuse me, as Christians, in the midst of all this crooked and perversion in this generation, we have to be lights. Filled with the love of God. If we're saved, we got to look saved. If we're saved, we got to talk like we're saved. If we're saved, somebody should see us coming and say, hey, there come a child of God. Even though we are saved, we still have to be filled with the Spirit. And if we are filled with the Spirit, we can worship the Lord. If we are filled with the Spirit, <laughs> we won't leave church before the service is over. If we are filled with the Spirit, we can walk like Daniel and the lions did and not be afraid. If we are filled with the Spirit, we can be like Paul. Preach our way into a Philippian jail and pray our way out. If we are filled with the Spirit. You know, God promised us a place of peace and safety in the midst of everything that's going on around us. So, don't worry about what's going on in the world. Be concerned, but don't worry. Just like Noah and his family, 
they were kept safe from the flood waters in the ark. We in our day, we can be uh, kept safe from the flood of unrighteousness that's going on all around us in our spiritual ark, which is Jesus Christ. Because the only safe place for us as Christians is our surrender and complete obedience to Almighty God. Because there is safety just by being in the will of God. There's safety. It don't matter, matter uh, what physical place we're living in. Our safety is in him. And he promised us that in Psalm 91, that our safety is in him. Psalms 91, 5 through 7 says, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day. Verse 6, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. Verse 7, a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. That's powerful right there. You ever heard a Christian ask you, or say why they've been victim of violence and suffering if God word promises them safety? Sure you have. I have. I probably said it myself. Before I knew what was going on, before I was snatched out of that darkness and put over here in the light, I probably said the same thing, you know? Uh, but first we gotta understand that there are two kinds of suffering. First, there's suffering for Christ. Now, this surf suffering is the kind that we go through for the cause of Christ, as we are prosecuted for being righteous. Don't you see that on the horizon? You see that on the horizon. Example. Going that extra mile, turning the other cheek, going without pleasures for the gospel's sake, suffering because of others' wrongdoings toward you. That other suffering, number two, is suffering because of our sins or others' sins. Did you know that the sins of commission brings a curse? These sins are deliberate sins. These are sins that rebels against God's ways. Sins of omission can also cause us to suffer. These sins are failure to pray. Failure to give, failure to obey, and failure to take the time to learn God's ways. Failure to take the time to learn God's ways. James 4, 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. See, a lot of Christians are suffering not because they are rebellious but because they are ignorant of God's word and God's ways. Hosea 4, 6 says, 
My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. How many times the pastor got to say that? Every other Sunday that comes out of his mouth. But it's true. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Now he's not talking about the intellect of this world. Uh Uh-uh. He's talking about the knowledge of God. My people, paraphrase that, my people are destroyed because of the lack of knowledge of God. Sometimes we as Christians suffer because we're lazy and we suffer because we're complacent. One, we don't pray like we should. We don't read the Bible like we should. We don't witness. And we don't give our tithes and offerings. But when we do these things, we build a relationship with Jesus. You know that safety that God promised us? We ain't going to get in that safety until we build a relationship with Jesus. Psalms 91, 1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So if we want to be protected under God's wing, in this violent time that we live in right now, we got to be totally committed to God's will. We got to obey this word in the Bible. And most of all, we got to overcome self. We got to overcome sin, and we got to overcome Satan. Now, to be an overcomer at this hour and conquer the threat of violence against us, we got to walk in faith. And we got to trust in God's promises of safety and deliverance. We have to remember that Jesus said in Matthew 26, 24, 6, 13 through 14, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. But all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. I get out of that right there, that he's telling us not to worry. Be concerned, but don't worry. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Bottom line, things in this world are going to happen. But as Christian folks, we don't need to worry about it. We need to pray about it. In closing, I guess Peter said it best when he said, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. For Christians, this means we should live our lives in such a way that we reflect our understanding of what is going to happen. Because this life is passing away quickly. And our focus should be on the new heaven and the new earth to come. That's what our focus should be. On holy and godly things. 
Our lives should be holy and godly. And we should be a testimony to those who don't know the Savior. I should be a testimony to those people in my family that don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. You should be a testimony to some of your family members that don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And we should all be telling others about him so that we can all escape that terrible fate that await those who reject Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We wait in an eager anticipation for God's Son to return from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even who Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And all I can say is, and I hope all you can say is, come, Lord Jesus, come.